Hey everybody, Victor here. Let's go ahead and get started with the guide to naval combat. Now before I get started, I wanted to point out that unlike a lot of other things in EU4, naval combat is not really in the game files able to be seen in terms of the equations. For one reason or another, some elements, some mechanics about naval combat just aren't in the game files. You can't actually pull up the equations for them. A good example of that is capturing ships. It's just not in there. So I had to use tried and true pure observation and try and figure out how the mechanic works so I can give you a general breakdown. So unfortunately I don't have hard math. I simply wanted to give you that information so if you're playing and you notice something slightly different, that is why. It should still work this way in large part, so keep that in mind. But let's go ahead and get started. Now the best place to get started with naval combat is simply a couple of basic mechanics. I'm not going to go into tactics now. I can go into tactics in another video because it's largely the same as land combat. Now, first real thing you need to be under you need to understand is engagement priority. Just like you wouldn't want cavalry at the front of your in the center of your army or your artillery in the front line, you don't want to have your transports being the tip of the spear. As a result, the priority of ships that'll go in are first heavy ships then galleys, then light ships, and transports, until either one of two things happens. Either your engagement width is filled, or, in the alternative, you run out of ships. Be aware, though, your engagement width may not fit all these ships. What I mean by that is, if you have, say, 50 combat width of heavies, but you only have 25 combat width, that means you'll have 8 heavies enter the fight and then one galley, light ship, or transport. In fact, you'd have two galleys because they can fit into one combat width. The reason why is that would equal 25. And it will fit everything it possibly can into the fight, not just heavies and if you have another heavy in reserve. The other thing to know about this, it will also work with reinforcements, but the same rules apply. So a heavy will not take the place of a light ship unless three slots are open to fit the heavy in. As such, if you're trying to do reinforcements, galleys or light ships may be easier to fit in, especially if you're having your transports jumped, than heavy ships. However, there is something in the game called disengagement, and I will get into that mechanic later. But I wanted to point out that once a ship disengages, it is done. It cannot come back into the fight. It doesn't come back to save the day. They run, they run. They don't come back. So, as long as you see that, they're done. Now, when we come to combat phases, in land combat, you'll notice that there are infantry, cavalry, they have shock and fire pips, they'll have shock damage and fire damage. That is not how naval combat works. The only difference you will ever have is in your admiral pips. Ships do not have pips. Ships do not have phases that really matter one way or the other. They have the same amount of damage in both phases, and I'll get to that later. So, whether it's fire or shock, it's the same equations and the same considerations. In terms of the ships themselves, every country and every tech group has the same ships. What I mean by that is, while the First Nations, so the Aztecs, the Iroquois, all of them have war canoes, it is because they're tech level 2. If you make all of Europe tech level 2 and the rest of the world tech level 2, they will also have war canoes. It is simply a part of the tech level, not the tech group. Lastly, we have engagement width. Engagement width, unlike land combat, is not whoever has the highest, that's the one that controls. You can actually have different combat widths, and you will be limited to whatever your combat width is. The easiest way to explain this is if England has 100 combat width, and you as, say, Portugal, only have 70, they get 10 more heavies to fight you with. So having more engagement width will usually be what ends up breaking a battle one way or the other. You'd have to have extremely good quality ships to beat the outnumbering part of it. This can be deceiving though. And the reason why it is deceiving and it doesn't always work that way is because of targeting. Now the way targeting works is each ship can fire upon any other ship as long as it's in the fight. Which means unlike land combat where the infantry is firing at the guy right in front of him, or the cavalry can flank, but they are still limited by who they can target. Same with artillery. The same is totally not true when it comes to ships. As a result, if you have 100 ships in a fight, they can all target the same guy. 
and sink him in one tick. However, that would be quite rare. The way it works is each ship that it could target gets a base chance of 10. After that, if they are the same type of ship, so say you have a galley trying to find a target, if it is another, you have another galley on the other side, it will get plus 5 to that 10. Then it will assign a random chance to every ship between 0 and 5. It's just a d6 roll and it adds whatever it has. If they are below or at 0 morale, it is made into 10% of that. In other words, you will almost never target anything with 0 morale. And then lastly, if they are strength 50%, not morale, but actual strength, which you'll see here in the percentages. If they are at 50% or below, they get double the amount. In other words, if you have a ship that is below 50%, they are a massive target that a lot of ships are going to pounce on trying to sink. This is why, if you notice, some of your ships suddenly get blipped out of existence instantaneously. It's because they dip below 50% and then everything turned on them. So, and then it's simply, whoever has the highest number, that's who they target. If they have the same number, then it flips a coin and it randomly assigns one. So the, I think the easy way to explain this is, if you notice, some people have been putting out that you are the best navy you can have is a bunch of galleys and then a handful of heavy ships, saying that the heavy ships are tanking for the galleys. This is not how it's working. It is working the exact opposite way. The heavy ships are taking pot shots because the galleys are absorbing the damage. And I mean that because, again, targeting is based on plus five if they're the same type. For them to target the heavies, they would have to roll a zero on the random chance for the galleys and a five for the heavies, and then the coin flip goes in favor of the heavies. I mean, then they'll target the heavy, which takes less damage, and I'll get to that. The other thing I wanted to point out is why engagement with is not the end-all be-all. As you can tell, I'm pretty sure some people have noticed this already, by the screenshots, you can miss. What has happened here is effectively, and I'll kind of go into it a little bit more later, there is a possibility of you building a ship or building a fleet design where the enemy can simply fail to engage your ships. This is not a per tick modifier, they stay that way. Meaning they're not taking up engagement with, but at the same time they are not contributing to the fight whatsoever and they largely will stay that way, unable to contribute to the fight whatsoever. The easy way to phrase this is they you've isolated part of their fleet and you sink that, leaving the rest of the fleet intact. Here's the thing. If you do this and you stack wipe the fleet, you also stack wipe the ones that failed to engage. Meaning, in this circumstance, I sink the entire Spanish fleet because half of it did not engage my fleet. Meaning I didn't even have to fight them. How you'd accomplish this is basically faster ships, plus a higher maneuver speed admiral. This was Horatio Nelson, so he had six maneuver pips to the Spanish two, meaning they had no real chance of catching up. Now, I'll go into the faster ships later when I talk about their actual stats, but I'll get there. The next part is disengagement. Disengagement is when a ship decides to tuck tail and run. Now, you can't decide when this happens without retreating the whole stack. However, each ship can choose to do this. When the ship hits 0.5 morale, and that is actually 0.5 morale, not 50%, at the beginning of the game, you usually have 2.1 naval morale, so 25% of your morale. Late game, you have between 6 and 7, so you have a lot further to go. Once you hit that 0.5 threshold, your ships, everyone's ships, has a chance to disengage from the fight. This has two benefits. One, it prevents the ship from sinking. Well, it has three. Two, it allows another ship to take up that combat with that will not be as diminished, meaning it can do more to fight. The last bit about this is that you're preventing the ship from being captured, and I'll get to that when I get into ship capture chance. Here's the thing. When you hover over the little red dash in the combat window, it will tell you, unless you're one of three tags, you have 10% chance for this to happen, which means once you hit that 0.5 threshold, every tick, the ship will roll a d10. On a 1, it retreats. It saves the ship. On anything else, they stay in that fight. Till either they are sunk, or they successfully disengage, or lastly, the battle ends. Now below, you'll notice that there are 
three tags that have an increased chance. That is Australia, Denmark, Portugal. Nobody else gets them. These are in their national ideas, making it 15% chance, which means they're able to preserve their fleet easier. Meaning that when you engage a Portuguese fleet, while you may win that fight, there is an increased likelihood that those ships will get away. Meaning they'll be able to go back, repair, and come back at you over and over and over again. That is one of the advantages of the Portuguese fleet. Same with the Danish. Now the next screenshot you see here is simply showing you the color codes. Red means that they're below 0.5 morale, but they have not disengaged yet. Meaning they're still in the fight, taking up combat with, being annoying. Green means that they have over 0.5 morale, they're still in the fight, they have no interest in running yet. And purple means that they have disengaged. Now here is the key thing to be aware of when it comes to why they're disengaging. It is because after so much, say this 0% guy or these 2% guys, they're not doing anything. And this helps prevent you from having a wasted unit in there. So having high disengage chance is a very nice thing to have to cause damage against the enemy. These are the basic ship types. Go ahead and pause if you want to read them if that's what you want to do. I removed the trade power from light ships because that's kind of irrelevant to this discussion. However, if you notice, they all have a few certain stats that are kind of common through everyone. You have the ship icon, the cannons, the arrows, and the sailors. These are probably not what you think. The way this actually works is the hull icon, that is not HP. That is not how much damage it can take before it sinks. That is the damage resistance versus the number of cannons. In other words, 12 to 20 means it will take less damage as a heavy versus the 40 to 20. For obvious reasons, that's 2 to 1 versus about 0.6 to 1. Meaning that galleys do less damage or are supposed to do less damage. That is how the math is supposed to work. Obviously, the same is true when it comes to transports. They are able to take more damage from a galley than another galley can. Because it has a higher ratio when it comes to cannons to hull. These arrows do not mean map speed. These are the tactical movement speed. I'll kind of talk over those, about that in a second. Sailors, this is the actual HP of your ship. So when you look at these numbers over here, these percentages, these are actually the percent left of your sailors. Meaning that when you look at this 0 or 2% galley, that means there is only 1 or less than 1% to 2% sailors left on board that galley, which means there's one guy hanging on for dear life, hoping the ship doesn't sink. And if it somehow doesn't, he's the guy that sails it back into port and becomes the new captain, I guess. So that is what that is supposed to mean. Now here are the two different speeds. You have tactical movement speed and strategic speed. Strategic speed is actually your map speed. Why they don't show this in game, I really don't know. Because I'm pretty sure there's been a lot of people that could not figure out why their galleys, who are apparently supposed to be faster than your cogs or your heavy ships, are not as fast. But if you look, even their fastest galley is still not as fast as the slowest of anything else. And the fastest of anything else is not as fast as the slowest light ship. This right here actually dictates it. And I don't know exactly what the map time, the tech times are off the top of my head, but you can look them up. Now here, these, this tactical movement speed, if you actually look at the ship types here, you'll notice they don't change at all at any tech point for any ship. The reason why is this, the speeds, goes into your ability to evade being targeted. In other words, because I was fighting heavies versus heavies in both of these fights, they were not able to actually engage me because their ships were just as slow as mine and my admiral was so much better in maneuver, I was able to avoid them. However, if they had light ships, I'm not likely to evade light ships with heavy ships. If they had galleys, it would have been more difficult for me, but they didn't have them. As a result, having this high maneuver with using the tactical maneuver speed 
you can build a navy that may, I mean may, because this is one of the things that they did not have the equation available for, be able to have parts of their fleet simply unable to engage. And they will stay out of the fight. Meaning that if you do this correctly, you might be able to engage the English without them being able to fight back. So let's go ahead and move on to the actual equations. Now, I understand a lot of people don't like math, but trust me, this is not overly complicated math. I'll break it down element by element. You are not expected to actually understand or do any math. Here you have the t first feeder equation, base hull damage. It is 0 0.025 plus 0 0.025 times 2 plus dice plus combat modifiers. So dice, fairly obvious, it's whatever you roll. So the higher the roll, the better it will be. Combat modifiers are either Admiral Pips, those are useful, or there's two other sources. You have the Wooden Wall Doctrine, the Naval Doctrine for the British culture group, so Scottish or English, Welsh, they can have this. Or you are Malaya. Malaya has in their national idea set a plus one to dice rolls off your own coast. It's the exact same thing as Wooden Wall. This will give you the plus one dice roll, it goes there. Those are the only things that go here. So realistically, most of the time, it's just two plus dice, and then that, throw that in there. The next part of this, the next feeder equation, is artillery fire modifier. Now, this is the difference in the artillery fire damage. And I mean the artillery, as in from the military tech group. So you can't fall behind in military tech, even if you're fighting for the Navy, just as much as you can't fall behind in diplo tech. So this only counts if you are a if you have a difference in artillery fire. So if you are, say, England, again, and you are fighting Portugal, you are Tech 22 and they are Tech 22, you don't have a difference in artillery fire, so it is zero. However, if you are Tech 22 and they are Tech 21, there is a two fire difference in your favor, meaning that down here in the equation, you would have two and they would have negative two, meaning they do less damage to you. The reason I put the Spanish idea here of artillery fire is to explain this is why Spain has this. It is not because historically Spain had great artillery pieces or cannons on the battlefield. It is because the Spanish Grand Armada was loaded with cannons, giving them extreme firepower per ship. And that's simulated in the game by giving them more artillery fire, meaning that they will, unless you're beating them on tech, beat you with in terms of artillery firepower. So keep an eye on this, because it means the more this is, if you can catch somebody behind on a critical tech, you can sink their fleet very easily. Because if you look late game, these simple techs can give you a massive advantage. So let's go ahead and look at the actual equations. You have the base hull damage, which uh, was covered up here. Then you have ship strength. And this is in both equations, ship strength there, as well as here. This is the actual casualties or ship strength in terms of the percentages, the sailor amounts, and this is the morale damage. Both of them oh, are dependent upon the ship strength, and ship strength is measured in these percentages. As a result, this 0% ship cannot do any morale damage nor can it do any physical damage, but it is still taking up your combat width. Again, this is why disengagement is so strong. It gets the weak out so you can fight. So, moving on. Now you have ship strength, and this is simply the percentage in decimal form. Cannons over target hull. This is exactly what you think it is. This is right here. 20, 40 over 20, or 12 over 20, meaning that if you are a heavy ship bringing 40 cannons to the fight, if you are fighting against a galley, you are going to do more damage naturally than a galley will to a heavy. So keep that in mind because these numbers matter a lot in this equation because that would be 5 instead of 0.6, roughly. Then you have the artillery fire modifier. And just to point out, this artillery fire modifier is also in the morale equation, meaning that Spain has an ability to do extra morale damage even to Britain. And I'll get to that in a minute. 
Lastly, there is ship combat ability and admiral combat ability. They're in both equations. All of what I've covered so far is in both equations. Here are the two elements of each equation that are different. You have target ship durability for casualties, and you have country naval morale for morale. Country naval morale is exactly what you think it is. It is your naval morale. If you look under the military tab, you'll see what your naval morale is. That's what goes in here, and you divide it by three. This means that it not only increases your morale pool that you take as such as a health bar, but it'll also include your morale damage to the enemy. So the higher your morale is, the better you are both offensively and defensively here. Target ship durability, what that is, is if you look in the naval idea group, you get 10% there. Quality, I believe you get 5%. You get some from some policies as China enter the meritocracy. You can get another 20. Some national ideas like Norway get 10%. And what this does is if you look at the rest of the equation, you have multiply, 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 etc. until you get to the very end where it's divide. This means that every little bit of target ship durability is decreasing the amount of damage you take overall. Meaning that if you stack target ship durability, you can severely decrease the amount of damage you're taking to potentially a quarter to half. Meaning it is very difficult for anybody to actually sink your ships. They may beat you on morale, but in terms of actually sinking your ships, it will be very difficult. This is why people who take naval ideas are so difficult to fight in the navy aspect, because it is very hard to break their ships, or it's one of the reasons. So these are the equations that I wanted to show you how they're being played out. Now, I'm not expecting you guys to actually look at the math or do the math or anything like that. You can come and look at the equations later if you really want to. Here is what I, the takeaway I want to show you here. These are Carrix versus Galleys and Galleys versus Carrix. As you notice, the Carrick is doing more damage than six Galleys. These are all in percentage in decimal form. As a result, they're not doing a whole lot of damage early game. It will increase as time goes on. And you have to remember this is per ship. So yes, it does go up over time. Then you add the artillery fire from Spain, it goes up. If you're Add in China with the ship durability and the artillery fire, it goes down below what it was before. So yes, ship durability is very important, but dice rolls add a lot more to it. And no matter what of these are, they are, the galleys are still being beaten. The same is true with morale, except I swapped out China and put in Britain, showing here that if Spain has one more dice roll than Britain, they're doing the same amount of damage. The reason for this is that artillery fire basically counts as a dice roll. As a result, if you are England and you are fighting Spain, I would highly recommend you take Wooden Wall Doctrine, especially if they have a tech advantage on you because it's one of the only ways you're going to maintain your advantage, even in morale. The other thing to keep in mind is if you are England, you are not able to keep up with the actual damage which, as I said by the equation, which with the ship strength, will weaken the amount of morale damage that you are doing every tick. Meaning that as long as they can th keep their ships afloat long enough with morale, they may damage your ships enough to make them be ineffective. So keep that in mind. Now, in terms of inland seas, if you notice, these are the equations here. Once you hit to galley versus a Carrick, in the inland seas, they are doing more damage than the Carrick does per galley. Meaning that the six galleys will sink a heavy in an inland sea before the heavy can sink the galleys. However, galleys are still more effective against each other than they are against heavies, even in the inland seas. And I will point out, in the equation, you only get the inland seas bonus, which is 100% combat ability, in inland seas, only if you're a galley fighting a non-galley. This is not an increase of the combat ability with galley to galley. This is simply them fighting each other without that advantage. As a result, galleys are still not exactly ideal to fight heavies. They're good, and you may want to prefer heavies fighting galleys even in inland seas than other galleys, but it's your choice. And morale, it's the exact same. Galleys are better fighting morale than they are fighting against a heavy. The reason why is, again, 
the cannons to hull and the cannons to hull are so vastly different that even though the heavy is outnumbered, it is reducing so much of that damage coming at it that it is able to hang in on the fight. So why do people say, build all these galleys? The reason why is, again, targeting. You see, you're going to have six times the number of galleys. And if you look at the last part of this target selection here, enemy ship with the best scores picked as a target, if the previous target is about to go down, to sink, a new one will be picked. So if it takes 30 galleys to sink one heavy in a tick, and you have 40 galleys looking for a target, and they all pick the same one, only 30 will focus fire on it, sinking that ship, and the other 10 will find another. Meaning that you're not wasting any ammunition. You're focusing them down one at a time. And while the heavies can do the same, it simply has so many more targets that the likelihood of that is significantly lower. I'm not going to do the math on that, but I'm sure you guys can imagine if you're looking at 50 heavies versus 300 galleys, what the odds are of all 50 heavies targeting the same ship are. However, there are some practical considerations on why you don't do this, especially in a multiplayer game, unless you are a nation like the Knights. Here's, at the end of the day, what you're looking at. Galleys, especially in Leviathan, and before Leviathan, it was mainly not sailors that were the bottleneck, but I'm going to cover this anyway. Sailors are now the bottleneck. It is difficult, or at least more difficult, to have enough sailors to actually be able to do things. It takes three and a half sailors at the early game to fight an equal amount of heavies. Meaning that if you are going a galley route, you need to pump out more sailors into the fleet. Here's the problem. The moment you send out a ship out of port, whether on a mission or not, unless it's exploration, they lose sailors. As a result, you need to keep your galleys in port, otherwise you're going to be losing sailors that you need to build more galleys. Here's the problem. By doing that, you cannot patrol to prevent, to prevent piracy. You also cannot really get into a fight. And you can't even mothball. Because again, mothballing will drop these percentages down to 1%, meaning when you unmothball, they need to repair up to 100. And these percentages are your sailors. As a result, you can't mothball because it will take you basically regenerating all those sailors to put them on your ships unless you have them underneath your maximum, which is very, very difficult now. Again, earlier on, wasn't quite the case. Except earlier on, galleys weren't as powerful. So here's the thing. You can't really do that. And again, just to kind of point this out there, when you go to protect against piracy, what is being calculated, just to let you guys know, it is the number of cannons on the people protecting against piracy versus the cannons on the privateers. And since light ships are the ones that do privateering, you have 12 versus 10, which means you need to have an equal number of galleys out there, or 40 to 10, meaning you only need a quarter of the heavy heavies to try and keep them at bay. So unless you are a nation that does not care about trade whatsoever, and every country cares about trade, you really can't go hard on galleys too much. The other reason why you can't do it is quite simply force limit. It takes six galleys to fight one heavy in equal in terms of combat width. Here is the problem. When you go over your force limit, you pay an increase based off of how much above your force limit you went. Meaning that if you go 1% over your force limit, all of the maintenance, not just the ones that go over, go up by 1%. So if you have, say, again, 50 heavies, and somebody's building 300 galleys to fight you, and they also have 50 force limit, that means they are paying about 500% more to have that fleet in terms of maintenance cost. And I have the maintenance cost down here. So 0.4 seems like a lot to pay for a heavy. Until you multiply this 0.03 by 5, making it 0.15, for each galley. Which means, for each set of six galleys, you have to pay 0.9 ducats just to try and maintain an equal number to that 0.4 heavy. Meaning you're spending more than double. Just trying to maintain the galleys. You're also paying more money to build them. 
it costs 60 to build six galleys and 50 for one heavy. And every time you upgrade, you have to pay that full cost again. Meaning you are throwing money away to try and maintain this, and it also doesn't give you any room to maneuver in terms of building light ships. Whereas, while it would be bad to increase the 0.4 maintenance cost, they can easily afford to build a couple of light ships if need be. Or simply reduce the number of heavies to build a few light ships, because they're still not over force limit. And I'm sure there's going to be some people that say you can build buildings for this. Yes, you can. Those take up building slots that are better used for soldiers or for money than sailors and naval force limit, unless you are going a hard naval game. So let's go ahead and move on and talk briefly about ship capture chance, because I think there's a lot of misconception about this. I had the same misconceptions until I started digging into it. Unfortunately, this is one of the things that is not in the game files for easy access. As a result, this is kind of based on observation, which is not exactly reliable in this case. So you can capture a ship in one of two circumstances. Either when you sink it, and it will still call, cause the morale hit on a sunken ship, and I'll talk about that in a minute, and it will also capture them at the end of a battle unless they disengaged. As a result, the disengage chance helps counter people capturing your ships. Meaning that if you are the knights and you're fighting Portugal, they're going to be a little bit more annoying trying to get ships out of. Meaning as Portugal, you're able to fight them a little bit more effectively. Here's the thing. Things like some modifiers, like additional air chance, they modify a hidden percentage. Meaning you don't have a 100% more likelihood of getting an air, which is 100%. It doubles the, say, 2% per month that you get an error, meaning you have 4%. There is some conception that this is how capturing ships works. It is not. The 33% out of the naval doctrine is a 33% chance to capture a ship. Every time a ship sinks, you have a third of an opportunity to capture every single ship. If you have the prize hunter trait, that's another 20 if you have naval and diplomatic ideas, that's another 33%. And then if you have certain ideas, such as the knights, that's another however much. And if you notice, you can get above 100%. The other way you can get it is you get 1% for every Admiral Pip in maneuver. Meaning, if you were going that maneuver build as before, you might actually start capturing ships too. Here's the thing, there is also another misconception that it is based on Admiral versus Admiral. So if you have, say, a 4 Admiral Maneuver Pip versus a 4 Admiral Maneuver Pip, that there would be no ship capture chance. Not how it works. It is completely independent of whoever you're fighting. In other words, if you have 4 and they have 5, you have a 4% chance, they have a 5% chance, as long as you win the battle. You can see this by hovering over this little grappling hook icon. It tells you at a glance how many ships you've captured in that fight but if you hover over it it will tell you what your percentage chance is to capture instead of sinking you also get them at the end of it so here's the thing this is absolutely a build and this is actually why a lot of multiplayer games i played in don't allow the knights because people will build this and be intentionally annoying because it's very hard to win some against somebody after the first fight when they sink half your fleet and then later on, they're not sinking it anymore, they're capturing it. Now, I said that I would talk about the morale hit. This is something I wanted to save until now, because it is, again, something that is not in the game files. Certain countries get a reduction in this. However, from everything I've seen, your morale hit when a ship is sunk depends on how large your navy is and whatever your morale is. So if you have a two-size navy, at the beginning of the game when you have 2.1 morale, and one of them is sunk, you will lose 1.05 morale. You lose half because you've lost half your fleet. That is simply how it seems to be calculating. The larger your fleet, the smaller each hit will be per ship. The thing you have to be aware of, though, is the ship that tends to sink is the one that took a bunch of morale damage. And this is not off your maximum, this is off of whatever's remaining. So if you've already taken one total amount of morale to get that ship to sink, you only have 0.5 morale left in your entire fleet. Meaning, each time you sink a ship, you do a massive hit on the enemy fleet. Again, this is based on observation, which is extremely difficult to actually measure. But this is what I saw in my observations. 
Now moving on to flagships, because I wanted to cover flagships because a lot of people think they're only good for trade, while they can be extremely dangerous in terms of actual fighting. Every flagship will get the 50% cannons, 50% morale, and then 50 and 100% durability. This goes in this equation as more cannons, right here, but then into the equation as increased target ship durability, meaning that the ship will take less damage from every source. It just reduces it, period. Now you have other ones in here with more flagship durability, and I just wanted to point this out. If you are China and you take the right ideas, take all the ship durability policies, every single thing, you can on your own get up to about 50% durability. Adding on hull sheathing and the flagship durability, you'd reduce 0 0.009 damage to 0 0.003. So you're taking a third of the damage with your flagship, meaning it's likely never going to sink. It might get captured, it might lose its morale, but that doesn't mean much if it's not going to sink. The other ones in here that I wanted to point out are the Netherlands that get increased fleet morale, the engagement width, which can be massive, because that's basically an extra heavy you can bring in, which does not sound like a lot, but early game it is extremely useful. Then you also have the trade power, which is kind of useful because just kind of to deviate into it a little bit, this applies not just to transport ships. I've been told before by people that this only applies to transports. It does not. It applies to everything. You attach this flagship to your transport fleet, they will also provide you trade power. So I just wanted to cover that. And then the other ones in here, such as combat penalty when landing is removed, faster movement speed, being able to hunt pirates more efficiently as Spain, which you really need to do, especially in multiplayer, because everybody's going to steal your gold. So do not neglect a flagship because this might make the difference between you being able to fight England and win versus your fleet being stack wiped. So it is worth the investment if you can possibly afford it. Now, I wanted to give a brief showing of the naval tags out there because some of these are obvious that people have recognized before, some of them not so much. I've heard people say that some of these tags are just not as useful as England when they really can beat England quite easily. While Denmark here might not look like it can because it really doesn't have as much, much morale, it does have that global naval engagement. It has that force limit, meaning it can put out more ships. It has kind of the morale and has that ship durability. And Norway can absolutely keep up with that extra ship durability, which neutralizes any heavy ship combat ability as well as the same amount of morale. So if you want to play a multiplayer game and you really want to just hammer away on the England player, pick Norway and go naval. Suddenly you're going to find yourself able to largely complete, compete with the Royal Navy and be extremely annoying. But the most potent naval tag is not Great Britain. I wanted to point this out because a lot of people think it is. It is actually Malaya. Malaya has the galley combat ability. It also has quite high naval morale a lot of ship durability, and the plus one naval combat bonus off their own coast. Why does this matter? Because this is the Inland Seas map. As you can see, the ones that you guys would expect are there. The Baltic, the Mediterranean, the Black Sea, Red Sea, Persian Gulf, but then you have all of this in Asia, including all of Indonesia. All of Indonesia is Inland Sea, meaning that if you are Malaya, you are able to build nothing but galleys in the Inland Seas, meaning you have the plus 100% if they bring anything other than a galley, but you would even have the 25% on your own, and all of these tiles would likely be adjacent to your home islands, to your provinces, meaning that you have plus one to your dice rolls. Not even England would have that unless they own territory there, meaning you're able to fight even against England with a massive advantage. If that is what you guys have, take advantage of it, and sink the Royal Navy. So I'm going to go ahead and leave this here. The whole point of this is not to explain the tactics, but to explain how it is functioning so you guys can figure out your guys' own composition given your guys' own circumstance. Namely, galleys are usually not the way to go. It is heavy ships, and building the right combat width 
given your country's technology, because in Leviathan it is based on technology and a lot of other things, to make sure you're able to bring in as much firepower as possible and then reinforce it to increase the morale and to replace losses. Don't do stag death stacks anymore. It doesn't work. Beyond that, I'm going to let you guys go with this. If you like this kind of content, like and subscribe. I will be doing more of it. If you want to see a particular mechanic explained or you want to see a particular country, leave it in the comment below. I have a list going already and I'm moving through it at my own pace. So add it now or it'll be even later before I can get to it. But I'll see you guys all later. Have a wonderful day.